Hey guys! So today I'm going to be doing an author spotlight type of video and I plan to do these more in the future but I don't plan to do them the way that other people do them because I think a lot of people on YouTube do these author spotlights and I think that they do them better than me. Someone whose author spotlights I always love are Katie's from Books and Things. She recently did one on Emily St. John Mandel and I just finished reading Station Eleven last month so I'm really excited to pick up all of the things that Katie mentioned in that video. I guess the thing that's going to set this series of mine apart is that I'm going to be talking primarily about poets. I feel like on YouTube, poetry is often excluded or sort of um, categorized as difficult or as something that you're just not into. And I think that that's a shame because I don't think that poetry has to be esoteric at all. I don't think that poetry necessarily has to be harder or harder or less effective than prose and so today I thought that I would talk about Mark Strand because he's one of my favorite poets of all time. Last Christmas I found this gem in Fully Booked and this is New Selected Poems by Mark Strand. It made me really really happy because most of his collections aren't available here. Mark Strand is kind of like Margaret Atwood in a way where he wrote so much over his entire life. It's it's literally almost impossible to find all of his books. Not necessarily because there's a low volume of printing, but just because it's so old. Like some of the, the work in here was written in the early 60s. So it was really good for me to find this book because it doesn't do the usual thing where it's just sort of an anthology of the person's best work. Although I do have um, a book of his which is Selected Poems and that one does that. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in that one it's just sort of a catalog of his best poems. But here, what I really like is that they divided the poems um, according to each collection and so I feel like it sort of gives you a better narrative of Mark Strand as a poet and a better understanding of his body of work. I think with most poets, what happens to them is that they start off writing very raw. They start off writing in a way that deals with very romantic elements and they start off writing in a way that is very emotional and not very cerebral, I guess. What I love about Mark Strand is that his earlier work was super polished. I think he was sort of the king of the image in that way. Um, it's like he could take a certain concept and just bring it around, you know? It was very neat and his poetry went from when he was younger didn't sound like it was coming from a young person. So to sort of demonstrate that, I'll read two poems. This first one is from his collection. I have so many notes in this book. Uh, this is from his collection Sleeping With One Eye Open and this is the first poem of his that I ever read. It's called Keeping Things Whole. Keeping Things Whole. In a field, I am the absence of field. This is always the case. Wherever I am, I am what is missing. When I walk, I part the air and always the air moves in to fill the spaces where my body's been. We all have reasons for moving. I move to keep things whole. So in that one, <laughs> I really like how he plays so completely with that active movement and how from the way that his language flows you can really really sort of see this person moving and leaving behind him a sort of cutout in the sky and I think it's a genius. You know where some people, or most poets I think, most people, would pick an image. I think the image that Mark Strand chose for this was absence. And I love that he was able to pull that off. Oh man, I want to read it again. <laughs> and I feel like he picked such a vivid image to, to convey that absence. In a field, I am the absence of field. I feel like it conjures a sort of abundance of earth and of sky and vastness. And to think of yourself as the absence, as having to move to sort of fill that space, it's so beautiful and I think that in general it talks about restlessness, it talks about this need to move along and how when we stay in the same place for a really long time, you sort of blend into whatever it is that you're staying in. Ah, 
I love Mark Strand. <laughs> the second poem that I want to read from his earlier work is Eating Poetry. This is an Ars Poetica. Uh, for those of you guys who may not know what an Ars Poetica is, it's a poem that talks about poetry. So this is aptly entitled Eating Poetry, and this is from his collection Moving to Keep Things Whole. Oh, oh no, sorry. This is from his collection Reasons for Moving. Eating Poetry. Ink runs from the corner of my mouth. There's no happiness like mine. I have been eating poetry. The librarian does not believe what she sees. Her eyes are sad, and she walks with her hands in her dress. The poems are gone, the light is dim. The dogs are on the basement stairs and coming up. Their eyeballs roll, their blonde legs burn like brush. The poor librarian begins to stomp her feet and weep. She does not understand. When I get on my knees and lick her hand, she screams. I am a new man. I snarl at her and bark. I romp in the joy in the bookish dark. I was saying earlier that Mark Strand deals really, really well with movement. And I think that in this particular poem, the movement comes from not a forward thing or not something um, that's sort of happening to the persona externally, but something that is happening at first externally and then internally and then externally again, if that makes sense. He's reading a poem and as he reads the poem, that poem becomes part of him and I really love that bit where everything sort of bleeds together. <sighs> because isn't that the truth anyway? That um, I don't think reading or literature is like a topical ointment. And I think that that's why it's so often shoved aside or treated as something not important or non-pragmatic. Because the way that it functions is more the way that food functions. If you eat something, you know, it doesn't automatically nourish you. It needs to be converted into certain things in order to be consumed properly. And so I think that he chose the perfect metaphor. <laughs> Another thing that Mark Strand really likes to explore in his poetry is the concept of death. And I think something that I find really, really haunting about his body of work is that the closer that he got to dying, the more he talked about death. He started to experiment more as he got older and as he started sort of um, moving out of that usual central image that he would conjure, I feel like his work became more haunting and his work became a little bit fabulous even, I feel like. Um, if you guys have ever read any Raymond Carver, then you guys will know what I'm talking about, where images that he chose and language that he chose was very stark, but also very haunting and almost very thick if you think about the image as a whole. It's something that plays with repetition and plays with not the strangeness of things themselves but the strangeness of situations and the strangeness of the placement of certain images. So again to demonstrate that I'll read you guys something from his collection called... what is this? Okay. This is from his collection called The Story of Our Lives, and it's called In Celebration. 78. In Celebration, you sit in a chair, touched by nothing, feeling the old self become the older self, imagining only the patience of water, the boredom of stone. You think that silence is the extra page. You think that nothing is good or bad, not even the darkness that fills the house while you sit watching it happen. You've seen it before. Your friends move past the window, their faces soiled with regret. You want to wave but cannot raise your hand. You sit in a chair, turn to the nightshade spreading a poisonous net around the house. You taste the honey of absence. It is the same wherever you are, the same if the voice rots before the body or the body rots before the voice. You know that desire leads only to sorrow, that sorrow leads to achievement which leads to emptiness. You know that this is different, that this is a celebration, the only celebration, that by giving yourself over to nothing you shall be healed. You know there is joy in feeling, your lungs prepare themselves for an ashen future. So you wait, you stare and you wait, and the dust settles, and the miraculous hours of childhood wander in darkness. So yeah, I think that from that poem it's pretty clear what I meant earlier that 
the images slowly become more loosely wound and the images become more playful like there's more room for wondering what certain images mean there's more ambiguity but just the right amount of ambiguity and my favorite of all of his poems i think were the ones taken from blizzard of one this was published in 1998 and i think that this is the one that won him the pulitzer prize if i'm not mistaken oh gosh this is my favorite one this is called the delirium waltz i cannot remember when it began the lights were low we were walking across the floor over polished wood and inlaid marble through shallow water through dustings of snow through cloudy figures of fallen light I cannot remember, but I think you were there. Whoever you were, sometimes with me, sometimes watching. Shapes assembled themselves and dissolved. The hall to the ballroom seemed endless, and a voice, perhaps it was yours, was saying we'd never arrive. Now we were gliding over the floor, our clothes were heavy, the music was slow, and I thought we would die all over again. I believe we were happy, we moved in the drift of sound, and whether we went toward the future or back to the past, we weren't able to tell. Anxiety has its inflections, wasteful, sad, tragic at times, but here it had none. In its harmless hovering, it was merely fantastic, so we kept dancing. I think I was leading. Why else would I practice those near calamitous dips? I think it was clear that we had always been dancing, always eager to give ourselves to the rapture of music. Even the simplest movement, from the wafting of clouds to the wink of an eye, could catch and hold our attention. The rooms became larger and finally dimensionless and we kept gliding, gliding and turning. And then came Bob and Sonia and the dance was slow and joining them now were Chip and Molly and Joseph dear Joseph was dancing and smoking and the dance was slow and into the hall years later came Tom and Em and Louie and Karen were talking saying that blue slides into black but pale turns round to white and Jules was there in heels saying that blue slides into black Rosanna was there with Maria, and Jules was there in heels, and day and night were one. Rosanna was there, and Maria and Rusty and Carol were there, and day and night were one, and the sea's green body was near, and Rusty and Carol were there, and Charles and Holly were dancing, and the sea's green body was near. Hello out there, hello, and Charles and Holly were dancing, so thin they were and light. Hello out there, hello, can anyone hear out there? And the rush of water was loud as if the bathroom were flooded, and I was dancing alone in the absence of all that I knew and was bound by. And here was the sea, the blur, the erasure of difference, the end of self, the end of whatever surrounds the self. And I kept going. The breakers flashed and fell under the moon's gaze. Scattered petals of foam shone briefly, the sank in the sand. It was cold and I found myself suddenly back with the others, that vast ungraspable body, the sea, that huge and meaningless empire of water was left on its own. They drifted over the floor and the silver sparkled a little. Oh, how they moved together, the crystal shook in the draft and the silver sparkle, sparkled a little. So many doors were open and the crystal shook in the draft. Nobody knew what would happen, so many doors were open and there was Eleanor dancing, nobody knew what would happen. Now Red waltzed into the room and there was Eleanor dancing and Dawn and Jean were waiting. Now Red waltzed into the room the years would come and go, and Don and Jean were waiting. Hours and hours would pass, and the years would come and go. The palms in the hallway rustled. Hours and hours would pass. Now enter the children of M. The palms in the hallway rustled, and here were the children of Tom. Now enter the children of M. There was nothing to do but dance, and here were the children of Tom, and Nolan was telling them something. There was nothing to do but dance. They would never sit down together, and Nolan was telling them something and many who wished they could would never sit down together. The season of dancing was endless, and many who wished they could would never be able to stop. I cannot remember when it began. The lights were low. We were walking across the floor over polished wood and inlaid marble, through shallow water, through dustings of snow, through cloudy figures of fallen light. I cannot remember, but I think you were there, whoever you were. And, uh... So that's what I mean by them taking on a very Raymond Carver-esque quality um, and a very dreamlike quality. I guess that's all that I have to say for this video. This is gonna be a really long video to edit, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed this. I really hope that you guys check out Mark Strand. This book is available pretty much everywhere because it was published by Alfred A. Knopf. 
And uh, yeah, please let me know who your favorite poets are and what your favorite Mark Strand poem is if you are already into Mark Strand. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it and subscribe if you haven't and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!